All right, well, it's 6.30 by my watch. Uh, welcome everyone to our public meeting this evening from City of Eugene Parks and Open Space to talk about Black Oak Basin and the specifically the land management plan that we have a draft of to share with you this evening as we um, you know, give people a minute to uh, log in if they're having some issues. I will talk a little bit about logistics. Um, so you should come into the meeting being muted and we ask that people stay muted until we're at the um, Q&A time at the end of the presentation. Um, you can either submit questions in the chat or um, this is in a meeting format where you can unmute yourself. So we'll, um, you could also ask your question uh, verbally um, at the end of the uh, presentation. And to facilitate that process, we'll ask for people to raise their hand um, to ask questions if that's available to you. So there's, there's either, you could actually raise your hand like you would raise your hand in class and um, Alyssa, Govette is going to help us sort of manage and try to see who has our hand raised. There's also virtual hand raising in Zoom um, that you can, there's a, a button called reactions. And if you click on that, um, there's a window that comes up with, you know, like smiley faces and other emojis and stuff. And then you can also click the raise hand button and that should um, raise your hand virtually. I do want to also mention you probably got the message as you logged in, but the meeting is being recorded and will be available for people um, to view and listen to afterwards as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for being here. I do want to take a moment to center us in an acknowledgement that uh, the city of Eugene is in the Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional homelands of the Kalapuyan people. And following the treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people just were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Kalapuya descendants uh, may be citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Juan or the Confederated Tribes of the Sats Indians, and they make valuable contributions in their communities and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Uh, we acknowledge the sovereignty of the nine federally recognized tribal nations in Oregon and all American Indian and Alaska Native people who live here, um, and we are working to be better allies. Um, so tonight we're going to talk uh, specifically about the land management plan that we've developed a draft for for Black Oak Basin and also talk about some other future plans for the site. I do want to recognize um, a few of my colleagues who have assisted with this um, process and I believe are here tonight. Um, I know two of them, Alyssa, or sorry, Emily Steele, um, an ecologist for the city of Eugene, and Carolyn Burke is the uh, manager for the uh, parks planning and natural parks and natural resource planning section of which I'm a part of, as is Emily. I also want to recognize Jeff Kruger um, and his consulting firm, JK Environments, um, contributed to the um, planning effort for the trails and was instrumental in, in helping us put that together. And I wanna thank Alyssa for helping us um, with the logistics this evening. And I also wanna recognize the work of Philip Richardson, who I don't believe is joining us this evening, but he was really instrumental in uh, bringing the successful acquisition to fruition of this property. And also wanna um, thank Bruce Newhouse from Salex Associates, who's a valuable partner for us and helped complete the botanical surveys and other biological observations on site. Uh, overview of the presentation for tonight, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the geographic and planning context for this site. Um, how it came to be a park, um, and then dive into a little bit about the land management plan, 
um, which is the thing we're looking to have uh, comments and review from the public on. And then talk about, and then open it up for questions, comments, and talk about some next steps. So this map gives you, uh, just helps orient you to the site and where it is in the um, sort of medium scale context. Uh, Black Oak Basin is outlined in sort of a reddish orange there in the center of this map. Um, you can see it's sort of in this triangle uh, with 30th Avenue to the south and I-5 to the east. And then it adjoins or is, um, yeah, it adjoins Coriol Ridge and Bloomberg existing parks. And Coriol then also um, connects to Moon Mountain. Um, and I do want to talk, the other property around there is uh, private property. Um, and we are also close to LCC, which is to the south. And Hendricks Park and the Ribbon Trail are to the west. Zooming out a little bit more, again, to give you some other context, um, Black Oak, we consider Black Oak Basin to be part of our Ridgeline Park system, which is about 2,500 acres. Um, again, as I mentioned, there's a can point maybe Hendricks Park is here and the Ribbon Trail. Uh, LCC is across 30th um, from Black Oak Basin. And then we have Suzanne Arley Park, which is our largest park at over 500 acres, which connects to Mount Baldy um, and a number of other parks in the Ridgeline. And of course, iconic Spencer Butte is also part of that. I also want to mention while I'm here that South Eugene Meadows, uh, which is this property here, is another parcel that was purchased with the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Funding, which is the same funding that was used to help purchase Black Oak Basin. Uh, we's existing local and regional plans to help guide and prior help us prioritize our work. Um, they're at a range of different scales from very local, our local um, Eugene Parks and Rec System Plan, which was um, completed in 2018. We also have the Oregon Conservation Strategy, which is at a statewide level, um, which helps us prioritize state important um, plants and animals and habitats. And then we have kind of a mid-range uh, planning tool, which is our Rivers to Ridges uh, vision and plan. Um, and there's a link to the website there to, to see that information. And that's really focused on connecting habitats and trails in our sort of metro area, Eugene, Springfield, and some of the surrounding communities. And a lot of these documents are uh, outcome of um, extensive planning effort, including community involvement, um, and address protecting ecosystems, habitats, recreational access, and preserving open space and view sheds. So how did Bob become a park? Um, there was uh, the previous landowner actually contacted us in early 2018 or spring of 2018 um, and was interested in, in selling the property. Um, we weren't, we were a little dubious or skeptical of the value of the property, um, but went out there and visited the site and were, became really excited about the opportunity um, to bring this into the system because it hits, checks a lot of the boxes around um, interesting and rare habitat types, um, ability to have trails to help connect, have trails on the site and also connect between sites. Um, and has some amazing views. So uh, we really became excited about it. And at that same time, it, uh, uh, what do I want to say? Solicitation was open for the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program. And so we applied for a grant from that program. Um, the WWMP is a, a program that's funded by the Bonneville Power Administration and administered by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and they've funded several important positions in the Eugene Springfield area. Um, I already mentioned South Eugene Meadows. 
um, but also Willamette Lane's Thurston Hills, um, the Nature Conservancy's Willamette Confluence, and the McKinsey River Trust Fin Rock Reach, which you may be familiar with those. Um, those were all purchased with the help of this funding source. So the combined um, purchase effort, uh, we were able to leverage 300,000 of city funding um, with $1.1 million from this grant program and also a donation um, equivalent of seven acres to add to the 121 purchased by the grant and city funding for a 128 parcel um, new park. And one of the special things about this uh, grant funding is that it also provides money for stewardship. So we also received $115,000 for stewardship over the life of the property. So the goal of the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program is to protect land containing habitats and species that were identified in the Oregon Conservation Strategy that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so because of that emphasis on protecting land with um, rare or important excuse me, habitat and species, um, the WWMP requires a conservation easement on any of those properties. Um, a conservation easement, if you're not familiar with that term, it's a legal agreement that's attached to the property um, and is typically designed to protect um, specific conservation values by limiting uses on the site. Um, specifically, um, we negotiated with the Bonneville Power Administration um, for the following things to be in our easement. So um, we prioritize protections for oak and prairie habitat and associated wildlife, while still allowing for certain stewardship activities, public access, and trail development. Um, so what are those conservation values out here? Um, as you might expect, given its name, um, there's California black oak, and this is near the northern extent of the range of California black oak. Um, so it's pretty interesting to have it here. Um, we have Oregon white oak, ponderosa pine, and Pacific madrone as well. There's a few Oregon conservation species, including acorn woodpecker, shown in the middle picture down below, a few other birds, and uh, western gray squirrel. Uh, there's also the oak and prairie habitat type um, as a unit. And then uh, we also identified the connectivity of this land to other parkland, which helps to create, even though the parcel itself is relatively small compared to some other of the properties that are protected by this um, program, it does create a, three, a nearly 300 acre block of open space. Um, and lastly, the headwaters of Russell Creek come off of, flow off of Black Oak Basin um, down towards the Coast Fork and the Willamette Confluence. Um, and that was also identified as a conservation value. So our plans at Black Oak Basin sort of center around protecting and enhancing these habitats for the plant and wildlife species that use them. Um, so this land management plan that I keep referencing is a little different from some of our other plans because it follows a specific format that's required by Bonneville Power Administration. Um, so it's not, if you, you may be familiar or may not be familiar with uh, some of our natural area management plans, it's also not a master plan. So it's, it's different from, you, um, some folks may have participated in the Suzanne Arley master planning effort or uh, we had recently have been working on Santa Clara Park master plan. This is a little different. Um, we will be doing a broader master planning effort in the future to identify broader goals and project for that sort of larger complex of parks, think parks including Bloomberg, Bob, Coriol Ridge and um, Moon Mountain, and maybe thinking about connections over to the Ribbon Trail and those sorts of things. So we recognize that as a need um, and are looking forward to doing that in the future. But right now we're focusing on this land management plan as a requirement of our the funding that we received. 
Um, it addresses only the grant funded project area and I have a map coming up that I can further show you what I mean by that. Um, and this plan will really, really focuses on what we will do on site to protect and enhance the conservation values I just described and what we think are compatible public uses. And all of this is within a 10 year timeline. So we will have to do another management plan for the next 10 year block of time um, at, in approximately 20, 2032. Um, this plan requires uh, public outreach and tribal review. We have sent the plan to um, the Warm Springs, Siletz, and Grand Ronde tribes for review. And um, we are in part doing having this meeting today um, to fulfill this requirement, but also just to share what's going on at Black Oak Basin and get your feedback on it. Uh, this plan is due in March. Um, and it will be reviewed and has to be approved by BPA and ODFW for us to move forward with the things that we have proposed in the plan. Um, I, I invite you, I'm not gonna go into every element of the plan because it's it would be a lot. Um, and I, but I want to invite you to um, review the plan on the Engage Eugene site um, at your leisure, or maybe you already have, um, and provides comment on it. But I do want to go through some highlights of the plan, um, but invite you to take a closer look if you have interest in time. Um, and this plan is really going to function as a planning and tracking tool for the city, BPA, and ODFW to ensure that we're meeting the promises that we gave when we applied for the funding in terms of what's in the easement, what was in our application, that sort of thing. Um, and it really required some developing this plan, required assessment, planning, and setting achievable goals um, that we're gonna be accountable for to BPA and ODFW. So here's another map of Black Oak Basin. Um, and I mentioned earlier that the plan only uh, applies to the part of the park that was funded by this plan by the WWMP and, and is covered by the conservation easement. So only the um, area that's sort of highlighted in yellow, that's the part of the park that is covered by the conservation easement and this land management plan. The, Part that's in red then outlines the full, you know, then is the full outline of the park. Um, and that red area that's not covered by the easement is what was donated by the previous landowner. So the yellow is, I think it's actually 121 acres. Um, and then with the seven acres, it's about 128. Um, again, just thinking about neighboring land use, there's uh, private land largely on, on all the other sides, except those that are highlighted in green. Um, it is accessible, um, pointing on the screen that you can't see, um, from Bloomberg Road here. Um, there is only right now parking along the road. Um, and I just ask that, you know, it, you can get to the park, but ask that people are, um, respectful of the neighbors in this area. And we will be sort of adaptively manag managing this in terms of thinking of, of parking and that sort of thing. Um, you may be needing to move up some of those timelines for parking at Bloomberg Park. Um, but just wanted to mention that you can also walk to the site. Um, if you come from Moon Mountain and walk um, through Coriol Ridge and over to Black Oak Basin. Um, we have markers up where there are existing trails that cross over to the private property. Um, so please uh, respect those markers as well. Um, existing facilities and infrastructure on site, the taint, or the, sorry, the white or grayish colored lines are the existing roads and footpaths. There's some dashed lines there that sort of are existing more of like trails. And the solid lines are former um, 
logging roads and other access roads on site. There's also the purple shading, our existing uh, utility, uh, utility easements, or not, yeah, utility footprints for power lines and um, gas lines in the area. Some site history. Um, we know from some of the general land office records that pre-Euro American settlement, um, this site was largely oak savanna and prairie. Um, looking at the maps on the right, I put this up here just to kind of give some context for why these habitats are considered um, priorities by um, a lot of a lot of people in our area. Um, historically, so again, um, around the 1850s, a lot of the Willamette Valley, which is what's shown in this kind of funky shape here, um, a lot of the Willamette Valley was covered in oak and prairie habitat that's shown in the yellow and brown color on here. And then since then, there's been a, a lot of habitat loss from uh, urbanization, uh, agriculture, forestry, you name it, lots of things have impacted those habitat types. And you can see there's very little left. So it's thought that there's definitely less than 5% of oak and prairie habitat and, and some estimate even less than that remaining in the Willamette Valley. And so that is why it's considered a priority to protect what's remaining and help to restore or enhance um, any that's degraded that's available for um, restoration. So since the 1850s through about the 2000s, this site um, became forested. Um, that's largely because the fire that was on the landscape, either wildfire or fire set by um, indigenous people who used fire to maintain habitat um, was removed from the landscape. And so uh, forested habitats came in, a lot of that's dug fir forest as we had a, a, we had a wet climate at that, more, um, more of a wet climate at that time. Between the 1850s and 2000s, um, then a, some dug fir was harvested off the site. Um, you can see in the, I don't remember which appendix it is, but in one of the appendices to the land management plan, you can see a sequence of um, historical aerial photos from like the 1930s through to present that I think are pretty interesting to look at to see the sequence of change on this property. Um, the last harvest um, was around in the 1990s, probably around 1994. Um, and then since the 2000s to present, um, a lot of invasive shrubs and small trees have colonized the logged areas and really overgrown those areas um, because there hasn't really been any maintenance or management of the property. Um, there, but there do, do still, there are still, sorry, legacy Oregon white oak, which means larger Oregon white oak and California black oak trees on the site, which is one of the things we were excited about. Um, and there have been downstream restoration efforts on Russell Creek. They have found um, coastal cutthroat trout there. Um, no salmon, but other salmonid species have been found. And so we really felt like this property was an excellent and regionally important restoration opportunity and the grant funders agreed. So currently on site, I've mentioned a few times already, oak habitat. So oak savanna, which is a more open um, land type. So sparse trees and then prairie. And then oak woodland has a denser, um, more, is more dense oak uh, cover. And then there's also hardwood, woodland and forest. And all of these habitat types are heavily impacted by invasive species, in particular, scotch broom, blackberry, um, uh, non-native hawthorn, cherry, and pear. Um, we do have, uh, thanks to some surveys from uh, that Bruce Newhouse completed for us, we know there's over 230 species on the site, but about 
50% of those are native species. Um, we've identified nearly 40 species of birds, including a few rare species listed there, and then some special status species. I already mentioned the Western gray squirrel, but there's also um, state threatened wayside aster, tall bug bane, another plant, and Tim Wart, also a plant on site. Um, so in the land management plan, we, um, the BPA wants you to identify goals, objectives underneath those goals, and then actions to attain those objectives and goals. And so we identified five um, overarching goals. One was to restore the oak savanna and oak woodland habitat and protect rare plants, reduce invasive species abundance, enhance wildlife habitat for those associated species, provide compatible public access and trails, and then just overall stabilize and maintain the site. Um, I do wanna mention that some of these goals or associated actions kind of overlap each other and um, kind of uh, build on or, or help support other goals and actions, um, such that a, a single action can positively impact several facets of the property. So I'm not gonna go through a lot of detail on each of these. Again, invite you to look at the land management plan, but I do wanna talk about a few things that you, what we mean by some of the work that we're talking about, what it might look like um, and how we're sequencing some of those actions. So from the present to through the first 10 years really that we um, are working under this land management plan, um, we'll be doing this oak savanna and woodland restoration, and that basically involves removing invasive shrubs and small trees, um, mostly using mechanical methods like is shown in the um, photo on the left, um, and then also using uh, so spot spraying herbicide um, to help uh, maintain the sites in um, prevent regrowth of some of the shrubs and trees. We will do this work while retaining multiple age classes of native trees and pods of native shrubs to provide habitat complexity. Um, we'll then be seeding with native grass and wild, wildflower species, also maybe doing some planting, um, but we'll do that after we assess um, what's in place underneath the shrubs in some places, and Suzanne Arley Park is a good example of this we went in and have done a lot of this type of work, um, largely for both habitat and fuels reduction work. So I do wanna mention that too, like removing this shrub layer is really beneficial in terms of reducing fuel loads for um, wildfire. Uh, so once we remove the shrubs and trees, we'll then assess the understory. So what comes in a lot of times when we uh, have removed some of these trees and shrubs or these really dense trees and shrubs underneath, there's some remnant native plants and seed bank that then just thrives after it's um, sort of released from the, that um, more suppressive shrub layer. Um, another thing we'll do is uh, in this time frame of the first 10 years is develop a canopy management plan. Um, and all of this work would be done before any substantial trail enhancement or new trail building would happen to avoid damaging new trails by um, moving the machinery in and out and um, moving out the woody debris if we would do that and that sort of stuff. So I wanted to mention that in terms of the sequencing. These are actual photos from Suzanne Arley Park as well to kind of show you that open area. You can see it looks pretty, um, like there's not much underneath, but a lot of that will grow back or there'll be native, native and non-native grasses will grow back in, but it, it will not look quite so barren. Um, but this is soon after that work has happened. Um, I mentioned the canopy management plan um, or, and that would potentially lead to selective tree removal. Um, so we hire contractors that um, and other partners in this area like the Nature Conservancy and um, 
Mackenzie River Trust and those folks that do um, similar work use these similar techniques of um, hiring these really skilled foresters that can use this equipment to remove individual trees um, and largely protect any of those we want to keep. Sometimes there is some damage to neighboring trees, but they're really pretty amazingly skilled folks. Um, and we would work to minimize soil impacts. You can see in that one picture, there are some tracks showing there. Um, we can seed over those and that sort of things. But um, that's another reason for us to wait until we finish the habitat work before we do some extensive trail enhancement. Um, in terms of what kind of habitat would be on the site um, when we're done or what we imagine it looking like, we, we come up with what's called a desired future condition map. And this is right now, as you can see, just done for that conservation easement area because it's part of the land management plan that only applies to that. But of course we would do uh, similar planning um, and consider the entire park in our, in our work. Um, but want to mention that we have a goal of having about 83 acres of oak habitat um, desired on the site, which would include both savanna and more dense woodland. Um, right now, that's about 21 acres. And then um, also have 38 acres of sort of hardwood and mixed woodland forest. So this orange color, orangish gold, and then the um, brown rusty color and this tan are all those sort of oak habitats. And then this other um, grayish brown is the hardwood woodland and then the green is the mixed woodland. Uh, we have another goal of supporting rare species and reducing invasive species cover. Um, this one is really in some ways hand in hand with some of the other work um, in terms of removing um, a lot of that shrub layer is invasive species like the scotch broom and hawthorn that's shown here and blackberries. Um, other things we would do include identifying, mapping and monitoring and then protecting rare species, you know, becoming familiar with their needs. What are we doing on site and what can we do on site to enhance those populations? Um, and then another um, goal is about maintaining and enhancing wildlife habitat. And besides all the things we just mentioned, um, through the support by general habitat restoration, and um, we would also work to um, protect specific habitat elements or consider specific ha habitat elements, such as this large snag that's on site, as you can see, this sort of dead tree that's partially broken off um, that's on the site here at Black Oak Basin. We would work to sort of protect things like that and maybe create snags as we're removing some, um, some trees to open up the habitat. We'd also work to protect or keep downed woody debris on site, consider pollinator species needs in some of our plans for planting and seeding. Um, and also uh, there is there are some small streams, I mentioned the headwaters. So we would work to protect that habitat from erosion and general degradation. There's also some wet areas that are probably more like wetlands on site that we will want to consider um, as we're more fine tuning some of our trail plans. Uh, speaking of trail plans, um, I want to talk about the trail siting process. Um, so we had an, an internal process, as I mentioned, led by uh, Jeff Kruger, helped facilitate our discussions and site visits and all of that work. Um, I've been mentioning a conservation easement. It does allow for uh, public access that was critical for us to allow public access, including hiking and biking. Um, we have within the conservation an allowment for up, allowance for up to uh, four and a half miles of unpaved roads and trails. 
Um, and as I've been mentioning, conservation values are prioritized over public use. So if there's a perceived conflict between the conservation value and public use at this site, we would um, need to prioritize conservation value. And that would be a discussion with the BPA and ODFW if that came to pass. Um, we applied a number of trail siting and design principles besides the sort of sideboards um, placed on the property, I guess, by the, the priorities of the conservation easement. We were looking for places where we could provide connectivity. So looking to the trails as a place to, in the future, connect to other sites connect to the, hopefully the right of way on 30th over to Ribbon Trail and Hendricks Park and across 30th to um, uh, Lane Community College and Suzanne Arley Park. Um, I will mention that there's an ongoing planning effort for 30th Avenue that I would invite people to take part in as you're able. Um, I'm just learning about it myself. Um, but there might be some opportunities for us to plug in um, and for the community to plug in and, and voice any interest you have for specific aspects of connectivity and road development and transportation needs. Um, so connectivity, sustainable trail design and maintenance are important principles that we consider when we're looking at it, um, designing trails. And by that, I'm um, thinking about our typical Western Oregon weather of uh, more wet and rainy and the soils that we have here and the fact that we're a little bit more urban and so we have a high use level and so we want to design trails that are going to withstand all of that and be maintainable for the long term. Um, I've been mentioning limiting impacts to habitat and wildlife and then we also prioritize the user experience and thinking about safety, excuse me, providing that opportunity for people to connect to nature, providing a variety of experiences and thinking about people wanting to access vistas. Um, an example of a, a nice vista at Black Oak Basin is this um, picture in the bottom right where you can see Spencer Butte from the site. So currently we've proposed th about three and a quarter miles of, um, of trail. Uh, 0.3 miles of that is mountain bike optimized trail and then almost three miles of shared use trail, which means, um, which to us means pedestrian and um, bike use. Um, we're largely making use of existing roads and trail segments. Um, that's about two miles of what we have proposed. And we do have some reroutes and new trails um, making up the remainder about 1.3 miles. Um, the pictures on the right show the condition right now of some of those road areas or sort of a typical condition of those road areas and pathways. Um, again, I invite you to um, look through the land management plan and the uh, appendices to get into some of these details. Um, and you can also ask some questions at the end of here, but there's a lot of information in there and there's a lot of information on maps like this one that I can't really, <laughs> don't really have the time to get into, but wanna give you some oversight of what is in here and what, what some of the general recommendations are, what we're putting forth to happen at the site. Um, on this map, um, this is showing the proposed trails and the color scheme represents the phasing of those trails. Um, so the red is phase one, which is within five years. Um, as I've mentioned, most of these are on existing roads, except for a couple segments of this. Um, the gold or orangish color are currently our priority two, five to 10 years out. And then priority three is the blue trails, um, which are 10 plus years. And then you can see, let's see, cursor over here, this 
little loop over here is a dashed line, um, and that's a priority three plus maybe, um, if needed in order to have our connection over to Coriol Ridge. Um, I do wanna point out, um, you might be aware of the development proposed north of the site. Um, that approval process and planning is still underway. Um, Parks and Open Space has expressed interest in connecting to and through the site. Um, to date, nothing has been finalized in that regards. Um, and that's unfortunately not something we can require um, through the approval process for the development, but it is something that we've shared. So if that doesn't happen, if these connections through the private property don't happen, um, we wanted to be sure to include a connection over to Coriol Ridge and then further onto Moon Mountain from our site. Uh, this is another map showing a similar thing, but with a different um, color scheme and different symbology, I guess I'll say. Um, the solid lines are shared use on existing road or trail. So like the solid red with the black outline, solid red here. The hashed or dashed lines are um, new shared use, the red is shared use, and the purple is mountain bike. Um, and then the black outline on some of these, red um, indicate that it's both a shared use trail and a maintenance access. So in terms of our site action timeline, I've been kind of talking about this, but wanted to sort of pull it all together a little bit. Um, the next one to five years, um, we'd be looking at shrub and small tree mastication. Um, we have funding for a lot of that type of work, either through the stewardship funding that we have, or we have funding through a long standing partnership with the Bureau of Land Management for fuels reduction work. Um, and so that's been a really valuable partnership and source of funding for us to think about the wild and urban interface and wildfire risk and uh, start to address that in some of these um, ridgeline parks. It's been a big portion of Emily's workload and others workload in the last several years. So we'd work on that invasive species control, um, the plan for potential canopy thinning and we'd be uh, maintaining the existing road network for public access. And when I say road network, it's not paved, it's just gravel or overgrown, um, overgrown gravel bed. Um, the next five to seven years would um, continue that work, um, work at likely do some canopy restoration through the, um, some selective thinning, continue trails planning and um, potentially some implementation. If we have funding for that and then ongoing habitat stewardship. And then the seven to 10 years, we'd want to identify and attempt to secure funding to implement, further implement our trails, plans, uh, parking and access to other parks and parts of the city. Um, skip there. And then next steps and looking to the future, um, welcome you to provide comments and ask questions. Uh, there is a survey on the Engage Eugene portal and there's a way to ask questions there. We'll also open it up for questions here tonight in a minute. Um, our land management plan is due to BPA and ODFW in March. So the portal is gonna be open through March until March 1st. Um, and then we'll be gathering those comments and any comments we get here tonight. Um, and consider those for our planning efforts. Uh, I've mentioned a couple of times looking forward, uh, there's nothing scheduled, but we do recognize the need for larger scale planning and connections to the adjacent sites and beyond. Um, and in, in saying so, I want to mention that while um, Moon Mountain and Coriol Ridge do not have a conservation easement, both of those properties have portions of the site that have really high quality habitat on them. Uh, Moon Mountain has 
I would say the best um, upland prairie of any sites that we have in our system. Um, and Coriel Ridge also has this amazing bald system or bald area um, with amazing views that we want to bring people to, but bring people to in a way that also protects that habitat. So I just want to mention that as we're thinking about larger scale planning. Um, and then also thinking about those other connections like over to LCC and Suzanne Arley and the Ribbon Trail. Um, I think that's all I have. Um, I do want to mention, so this llama is on here. We, there was a group of us that went up to Coriel Ridge um, early on after, I think it was not too long after we acquired that property. Um, and this llama just came trotting down the trail towards us. So we, of course, now refer to that one part of, part of that site as Llama Landing. So uh, my name, uh, email, and phone number are on here. And you can also access our, my email and Emily Steele's email from the Engage Eugene site. So I'm going to stop presenting here. See, maybe. Why? Oh, there it is. Sorry. Here we go. Um, I do want to, for a moment, allow my colleagues, uh, Emily or Carolyn, if you have anything you'd like to add that I might have missed in talking about our work out there. Um, the only thing I would add is maybe just a clarification of what a shared use trail is. I There's some comments in the chat about bikes versus hikers. And, and in case people don't know, a shared use trail would be shared between both hikers and, and bikers. And then the mountain bike trail is optimized specifically for mountain biking. In case that wasn't obvious. Yep, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Um, Alyssa, was there anything in the chat? And I, I see a hand up, but I didn't know if there's already questions posed in the chat that we want to answer. You think? Or? Yeah, there are some questions in the chat. Um, I think you should go ahead and let Benjamin go first, and then we can go through what's in the chat. Okay. Great. I will lower my hand. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you so much for all the work that went behind the scenes in acquiring Bob. I, I know it's hard for all of us to appreciate, you know, all the planning that that took and and getting everything together. And thank you for the work that's already been happening at Bob. So I, I so just to, so everybody knows me, I, I'm Benjamin Hansen. Uh, I live over by Moon Mountain Park. Lived here for 12 years. Uh, I'm the neighborhood adoptee coordinator for Moon Mountain City Park for for a couple of years now. So we've been getting started on building some trails in Moon Mountain and and trying to work to mitigate invasive species here. So I'm. Uh, I've hiked all over, biked all over uh, Moon Mountain, Coriel, and Bob before it was called Bob. So I have a couple, just a couple of comments. One, I think the mountain bike trail uh, at Bob Park has to be called I'm Sailing to reference uh, Bob from the movie What About Bob when he gets strapped to the sailboat and he says, I'm sailing, because that's what you feel like when you're mountain biking downhill. So I, I would like to publicly petition that the trail be called I'm Sailing. Um, the second comment that I have, uh, which relates to part of this about timeline, um, given that a lot of these trails already exist, the mountain bike trail already exists, the, the other shared use gravel trails already exist, uh, I, for me as a volunteer in the community, I would like to think that we can be a lot more aggressive than saying we can get this done in 10 years or 15 years, because at least in my experience working at a public university, Whenever my dean tells me they're going to do something in five years, that means it will be put off indefinitely. Um, so uh, I think all of us as a community would like to help and support those efforts. Uh, 
especially because I don't think that these trails will be as hard to develop as in other parts because they're existing roads. This is largely about, like you said, removing you know, the Himalayan blackberries, which I can see you've already been removing them off from these road segments, you know, so I'm not getting my arms cut up anymore if I'm running through there, which is great. Um, but uh, other than that, we don't need to bench out five miles of trail. We don't need to get excavators in there to excavate the trail. This is really just about getting a bunch of candy comms, a bunch of gravel, and then some compactors up there to compact it. So um, as a community, I, I, I completely support, you know, being involved in those volunteer efforts and, you know, volunteering my own sweat equity to help expedite that and get it to happen. And, um, and especially regarding the mountain bike trail, it's already there. I would prefer to get it on the map and get it more official because there, I already ride it. I know like teenage kids go and ride it and they don't even necessarily know what's on the trail. So I'd rather have the trail be marked and kind of rated appropriately so people know what they're going to experience versus like a 13 year old kid saying, hey, I'm gonna go ride this and they don't know a jump is on the trail. And you know, they join the clavicle club, so to speak, so. I appreciate all that. And I, I agree with, um, with the statement that we are using existing roads and it, like you said, it's not like we're starting from scratch. So there might be some opportunity to, to enhance and make them better. Yeah, I'll chime in on this one too. I mean, part of this, I don't know if you caught the phasing map and the, um, so one thing to look at is the trail phasing map, but the other thing was the slide that Shelly shared about kind of the prop with the actions that are going to happen on the property. And when, and also actually that other map that shows where we have are using the road system to be a shared maintenance access route and uh, future trail. And one of the things we're going to need to do very likely, um, almost certainly, uh, and we already know this, is that uh, when we have a canopy restoration plan for the park, which we're going to be developing a few years in, uh, and then doing it, that's usually about a two-year process, we're going to need to use those roads with big equipment like Shelly showed a picture of. And so we don't want to put a nice gravel base down on that and then drive all over it with thinning machinery and you know, big dump trucks and things like that. So there is sort of a need to get some of that habitat clearing done first. And we're gonna focus on the shrubs and the, and the invasive species because we really wanna get a good look at the oaks that remain so that we can do a really good plan for how we're gonna restore the oak habitat. And, and we are going to use that road system for, you know, top priority so that we can implement the tree restoration project, but we can't do that until we clear the invasive species. And so that's why probably for the first few years, we, we, we probably won't want to put surfacing down on those roads, but we have done something like that at uh, Wild Iris Ridge, if, if people have been out there, where there's a segment of an old road like this that's kind of wet, and we have put some surfacing down on the center, and that works really well um, when it's not going to get ripped up by big equipment. So there is a little sequencing piece and um, we do plan to do some small fixes to the roads that are out there in the interim. You know, there's some really kind of old, low, rutted out places and things like that. And we want to make that more stable just for people to use. Uh, but that's one of those things we have to balance with the habitat restoration. I see Paul has his hand up. Hi, Paul. I think we talked on the phone. Yeah, good evening. Uh, great work. I'd like to encourage the city to be as proactive as possible in making connections that go to the ridge line, or excuse me, the ribbon trail to the west. It looks like um, a person would have to make a very long slog along 30th Avenue to get to a, areas of park that are actually just a couple hundred yards away. Um, I was very involved in the Laurel Hill Valley citizens efforts around the Laurel Ridge development 
which, and I can't speak here for the Laurel Hill Valley citizens, but uh, that whole process was just awful. It involved a lot of unnecessary litigation, transferring a lot of money to the pockets of the developers, legal representatives without a very good result. And so I urge you not to rely on the planning process around particular parcels of our urban development, but rather to be proactive and to seek conservation rights of way for trails to connect. You know, there's gonna be a thousand people roughly living all clustered in 372 units on the Western part of the Laurel Ridge development right there below 30th Avenue. They're all going to be a couple hundred yards away from Black Oak Basin, but to get there on foot, it's very unclear. It looks like they would have to walk, I don't know, what is it, a half mile down 30th Avenue. Um, there's a lot of documents and a lot of planning that encourages this trail connection. You know, in addition to, you mentioned the Eugene Trails Plan, the Ridgeline Open Space Vision and Action Plan, but there's also the South Hill study, the Laurel Hill plan, the 2035 transportation system plan, the Eugene pedestrian and bicycle master plan. Um, so to stop talking here, uh, whatever you can do to be proactive in approaching those landowners, uh, I think would be very beneficial. Thank you, Paul. Carolyn, do you wanna? address that at all? Sure. Um, <laughs> thanks for the comments, Paul. And um, I agree with you um, that just because we weren't able to require um, that connection through the land use process that it, you know, it ain't over yet. Um, so we, we believe that there will be a lot of people living in those um, apartments that will want to access a trail um, that is in their backyard, essentially. And so we fully do intend to um, uh, continue to work with the property owner to see what kind of solutions we can find. So um, we will continue to keep that dialogue open. You know, we, we do only work with willing sellers. So um, hopefully um, once people are living there and it's clearly an amenity, that there will be that um, desire to, to make that connection. And in the meantime, we will certainly be stubbing out the um, trails on city property um, in that direction. So we're planning for those connections in the future. There's, there's also a lot owned by the Betts Evans Associates. Have you talked with them? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and, and we worked with them on this conservation easement. And so um, we will we'll continue to work with them too. Okay, I, we have some questions in the chat. So I think I'm gonna jump over here and we're gonna answer a few and then we'll come back to Jeffrey. And then I thought I saw Jacqueline, yeah, raising his, his hand in his video. Um, so is, is there an overarching goal for trails to connect all the South Eugene Ridgeline parks? Yes. <laughs> um, there, there are still some gaps in, turn, in terms of ownership um, to connect all of those parcels, but that's certainly one of those uh, visions that's been identified in the uh, almost 20 year old now, uh, Rivers to Ridges vision. And we've made a lot of progress. If you look at that ridgeline map, and if you go to the Rivers to Ridges website, you can see some maps in there to show um, the progress that's been made over the last 20 years to create some of those connections. And there's also interest in connecting. I did see a question about connecting to the east and thinking about under I-5 and over to Springfield and that area, like that would be amazing and is certainly another um, topic of conversation from visionary folks thinking about um, what, what might be and trying to make that happen. Okay, 
Um, aside from the soon to be final PUD in the notch between Moon Mountain, Coriel, and Bob, plus the 30th Ave plan, are there any other planning processes in motion right now that could intersect with Bob planning? Uh, I mentioned the, uh, I'm sorry, did, did that question include the 30th Avenue? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of other ones, Carolyn or Emily or anyone. I don't think so. Um, okay, we're gonna go to Jacqueline. Yeah, it's Brian. And Jeffrey. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I had just, well, first off, thank you for your efforts and the presentation and everything. It's uh, helpful. Um, my question, again, kind of goes back towards the, the mountain biking and uh, 0.3 miles of of mountain biking dedicated trail is, is, is fairly limited. I understand there's some multi-use trails uh, being planned there. Uh, my, can, uh, my ask is, I guess the consideration would be, you know, if Ben's up there rip roaring on the, on the mountain, you know, and soaring through it, like, uh, like he mentioned, it's one of those things where I think hikers don't necessarily like to have bikers flying past them. And so I think it would be beneficial for everyone if there was more dedicated uh, mountain biking trails so that you don't have that conflict um, where people are walking with their dogs on leash and someone's trying to you know, cruise by on their mountain bike. Um, so that would be one consideration. I think that would be beneficial. There's, I mean, Eugene in general lacks mountain biking dedicated mountain biking trails uh, sorely. You know, we, we travel up to Alsea Falls and all over the place to, to get some good mountain biking. And not only would it be good for the community here, but you know, it could draw in some um, recreation seekers as well, I think, which could be beneficial. Um, my other question, I guess, would be who, who manages, I live on the end of Bloomberg Road, and uh, it's, it's kind of a hot spot sometimes for overnight campers and uh, some illicit activities and stuff like that. And so I just wondered who it necessarily is in charge of kind of monitoring those areas, kind of safety, you know, closing of the gates always close right now. So everybody just parks out, out on the street. And, um, you know, how do we kind of monitor that and keep that a, a safe environment for not only everyone on Bloomberg here, but uh, people that want to come and use it uh, in the daytime as well? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm um, going back to the previous comment. I uh, agree about the need, certainly in our community, for mountain bike trails. Um, we're and you're probably familiar with Suzanne Arley Park, and, and that's what we're sort of considering our um, future destination location for all things mountain biking. Um, not, to, not to say that we're not going to develop other facilities and other places, but just in terms of a more substantial amount of trail, um, we're looking at that and also you know, have, have interest in a bike skills park there at Suzanne Arley Park. Um, and I also agree with the comment, and we definitely hear it about um, shared use not being ideal um, in terms of speed and people having different interests um, or you know different reasons for being out um, out and about. Um, we just have some, you know, we're. we're maybe have some growing pains around how we're handling mountain bike um, trails and biking on, on shared use trails and are, are working through that, making some progress, um, but I know we can do more. And so I, I acknowledge that comment and appreciate it. Um, as far as the activities on Bloomberg Road, um, we do have park, um, park ambassadors and park resource officers um, from Eugene Police that will come to, you know, even if the parcel is 
outside of the city limits. Um, if someone is doing something on city property, um, like Black Oak Basin would be, or Bloomberg, um, they can be called to respond to that along the road. I'm not sure if that would be, and I apologize for not knowing this, if that would be the county sheriff. Is that who you would usually call for law enforcement type? Concern? Yeah, so I think I think that's the issue. Uh, yeah. When we okay. have stuff happening, you know, we make a call and everybody points points the finger at someone else and gotcha. You know, they don't want to deal with it. That's kind of the why I was wondering, like, you know, who do you notify if there's some stuff happening? Yeah. Okay, um, there is the, I think if it's, you know, if it seems to be associated with the park, I would say definitely sending something through the park watch so that we're at least noting that and we can be sure to, um, I know it's kind of a buzzword, but think about adaptively managing our access there. And so if we need to move up a timeline of um, providing parking in Bloomberg or something to get parking off the street, we can you know, be considering that in our capital spending in terms of making that a better, um, better location for parking and getting people off the street to not be bothering neighbors and that sort of thing. So I would say park watch um, and, or I guess the sheriff if there's, or the county if there's you know, unlawful activities happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone has anything to add to that. Um, well, I would just say the park watch goes to, it does make a record of something being reported. And so when, if there were to be a lot of activities or something like that, that you were calling in, that's gonna stack up and it's going to get higher on the radar for Eugene police. Um, and also the park ambassadors, uh, it's they're mostly they're a daytime kind of um, resource for us, but they are trained in dealing with exactly situations like that. And so um, they're they are a crew of people that we could have uh, purposefully visit the park in specific locations to encounter whatever the uses that's going on and try to help address it. I bet Becky has some information for us too. Hi everyone, um, this is Becky Taylor. I'm a senior transportation planner with Lane County. And I'm so excited that the city of Eugene has um, acquired this property for, for public use and conservation. And I've been listening to your conversation about um, access, how to access it, Bloomberg 30th. Um, I'm, I am gonna be meeting with Carolyn and our um, design team to talk um, more about how Lane County can support um, access um, to the area. So um, I don't know what the solution is, but I want to I want to find one. Um, and then another planning effort. Um, there was a question about other planning efforts underway that could help support um, this property. Lane County um, is also um, developing a bicycle master plan. And it is focused on rural Lane County outside of Eugene Springfield, but this area is technically outside of their urban growth boundary. And um, we do have a, a couple of um, project recommendations and study projects. Um, I've been working with um, Jeff Kruger a little bit on some of the study projects um, for alignment with Rivers to Ridges. Um, so if, if anyone has concerns about that, um, you can contact me directly, I mean, but just know that Lane County and transportation um, really wants to support the city in, in this effort and supporting this park. Thanks for Becky. jumping in, Becky. Okay, let's go to Jeffrey. Yeah, thanks for uh, putting this together. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thanks for putting this together. I'm Secretary for Disciples of Dirt. And um, I just wanted to, to jump in a little bit on this proposal. I appreciate all the work that you're doing um, to acquire land. Once it's, you know, developed, we'll never get it back. And I know there's a lot of work behind the scenes to make this happen and that we're um, working well to develop some uh, 
trails currently in South Eugene and uh, hopefully here in the future, Arley. Um, and I wanna to talk to a few things. There's, I mean, almost every single other city has mountain bike trails and a pretty substantial network from right downtown. I mean, whether it's Corvallis or Sisters or Bend, um, there's trails really close by. Um, Arley is gonna be great. Uh, the skills park is something I personally really want badly. Um, but the other thing to really look at is that connectivity because mountain bikers don't want to ride, you know, half a mile, three miles, five miles. Typically when they go on their bike, they want to go 10 or more miles. And um, they're going to be a little less interested in doing that if, if the trails are double track gravel. I mean, that's if it's shared use double track gravel, it's kind of better than nothing, but it won't see a lot of use. Um, it'll be, you'll see more use if we have um, some mountain bike specific trails with a more natural, you know, single track uh, dirt terrain, um, you know, lumps in the trail and curves and, you know, just natural features instead of something that used to be a road. Um, there's an environmental part of this too. You know, when we have, feel like we have to jump into our car and ride 45 or drive 45 minutes to an hour just to get to a real trail, um, you know, there's gonna be a lot less pollution if we can feel like we can just stay in town and ride versus having to drive every time. Um, I know a lot of people that will not ride Ridgeline because there's too many hikers. There's too many hikers with dogs. There's too many hikers with unleashed dogs. And um, this created some um, conflict there. So I know you're limited, but wherever possible, if there could be some more consideration for mountain bike trails or single track that's natural, um, I think it would make the place more desirable. I also think that if you're looking at the conservation first aspect of this, which I completely understand and support, um, you're gonna have to do something about unleashed dogs because it's a real problem on Ridgeline. It's a real problem as Springfield knows with Doris Ranch. All these areas that have a lot of natural areas, you know, unleashed dogs are probably the worst thing for the wildlife. Um, so I think that's really all I needed to, um, to to say today. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Jeff. Jeffrey. Thanks. Um, I pretty much agree with everything you said. I don't have a, an answer to say yes, we're doing that, but all of those all of those things make complete sense in terms of um, yeah, having places to ride to and get to easily, close to town. Um, unleashed dogs, I agree, are, are an issue that's a challenge. We certainly don't allow them, but it's hard to enforce that 24-7 um, on every trail in town. But um, appreciate your consideration of that as well as an issue. Jeff, did you have something to add? I saw you popped in, yeah. Pop in again, yeah. I just uh, to add to kind of the discussion about uh, shared use trails and the thinking on this particular site. And as Shelley mentioned early on, because of the conservation easement, they're limited just in terms of not mileage of trails. Um, you know, in a perfect uh, situation, you have space and ability to do it like a parallel system. Uh, looking at the Eugene Trail Plan, that's kind of the guidance, either uh, parallel trail system, which is the preference and what uh, has been proposed over at Suzanne Arley Park. There's plenty of room and no limitation on uh, miles of trails like we had in this particular situation. So that's kind of uh, the process, the thought process for uh, not having pedestrian only and not having uh, a whole lot of like optimized trail on this particular site. 
Um, so kind of thinking about that. Um, and I did want to mention if people are, are not aware, uh, this is, you know, a lot of these trails, especially the phase one trails are certainly passable. Now, if you're interested in going out there, you can walk most of those trails uh, and without difficulty. And I, th I think that phasing uh, indicates when the surfacing would be improved to city standard. So five years uh, for bringing it up to a gravel surface, for example, but in the interim, uh, they're certainly passable. They may be a little bit wet, but really not too bad because of the slopes. Um, so the, the heavy uh, lifting of uh, woody and uh, removal is going to be happening in the next few years. So putting a nice uh, clean surface down and then uh, driving it over with uh, large vehicles is definitely something to avoid. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, there, it was uh, brought up a couple of times, but the, the plan definitely is to connect the entire Ridgeline Trail from all the way in West Eugene, Wild Iris Ridge, uh, straight on through, uh, through uh, Suzanne Early Park, uh, hopefully soon. I know there's uh, uh, funding available for at least portion of the trail coming up here in the next couple of years. And then, uh, the way Suzanne Arley Park is positioned with uh, Lane Community College, the, pa the, the trail would be able to pass through LCC and onto Black Oak Basin. So that connection is probably coming sooner than later. And as was mentioned, uh, Bloomberg Park uh, is not master planned or anything, but uh, we're identifying that as uh, potential trailheads uh, and trailhead parking as opposed to parking on the street with improved access. And that does tie into the 30th. Uh, avenue uh, refinement that's being looked at now as well, just providing better, a little bit better access into Bloomberg in the future. Right. So thank you for the comments on this. It's great to uh, be able to see uh, the string here. I would just add to your, or clarify something you said, Jeff, about Suzanne Early Park having like no, cons no restrictions and um, kind of trails everywhere is that, you know, you were, I know you were part of the master plan effort with us and we did come up with that sort of heat map of like intensity of recreation in different parts of the site. And so we did identify that sort of su Southern portion of Arley um, would be a little bit lower density trails, maybe just hiker only trails and then more the Southern or sorry, the northern part would have a, a, the more intensive, um, like you said, uh, shared use and a, a parallel system. Yeah, the with parallel system bike and, and, the map, yeah. and the skills park. So yeah, I just, just wanted, uh, to, I just wanted to add that. There's a little bit more wiggle room is, is kind of what I was getting at, just in terms of miles, miles of trails that could be constructed. Right. And you have your hand up again. Uh, yes, yeah. so I just had uh, two questions. One was that if you're going to be doing a bunch of Blackberry removals, which as much as I like my Blackberry jam, I'm 100% in support of that. Given that there's all these contiguous areas with Blackberry rambles that like go into the, uh, what do they call it? The forest, what is it? The managed forest area in the Laurel Ridge like proposed division or the blackberries, the, the patches go all the way over into Coryell Ridge and Moon Mountain and other private land. Is there any thought about also trying to do that removal of blackberries in these contiguous areas? That way, a bunch of birds don't just bring them back like in five years uh, or birds and bears. I mean, uh, there's both of those are in the, are there eating the blackberries, spreading them around. I do my best to can as much of the blackberries as I can to prevent their spread, but it still happens. Um, so that's question one. Question two, um, you know, as a, a fellow disciple of dirt, I, you know, I, I hear what ev everyone else is saying on the front for having more trails. One thing I, I had put in the chat that I just also wanted to note again, um, you know, I appreciate that there's a trail that starts at the top and it's, and it goes at least halfway down the elevation of Black Oak Basin. I think if it could go all the way down to Bloomberg Park, that would eliminate 95% of the complaints that you'll get from hikers about a biker came up and scared them because they were going too fast or a biker was coming down a trail and a dog was barking at them because it surprised the dog. Because at least from my experience at the Thurston uh, Hills Natural Area, 
there you don't have completely parallel systems because I do, you know, hikers do share trails with, with, with bikers, but the, those shared use trails are just when the bikers are effectively going uphill. And when I'm going uphill, I'm really slow. I'm not nearly as fast as, as, you know, Jeff Green, you know, so I'm going uphill at four miles an hour, slower than most runners. But when I'm going downhill, that that's really where the conflicts, you know, emerge. And and I, and in part, I'm I'm really happy that the the city is finally uh, developing some uh, bike specific trails coming off the ridge line. So I don't come down the Martin Street Trail as slowly as I can, still angering a bunch of hikers because the slowly, if I go really slowly, my brakes are too loud and they don't like that. And if I don't go slow enough, then they don't like that either. So yeah, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Um, I can I can answer the BlackBerry question. <clears throat> oh yeah, I forgot the BlackBerry. <laughs> Sorry, <I got> <laughs> Which is yes, uh, we are working on, um, we will be working on removing the Blackberry. And, you know, our first few years at Black Oak Basin are really looking at pre some pretty aggressive areas, clearing Blackberry out of there. So it should look pretty different. Um, once we get started, it should start to look pretty different over large portions of kind of the core part of the site, the flatter, the more basin, bottom of the basin kind of area. Um, and also anywhere we can get with a machine, um, we're going to try to mow those down. We don't right now have great access to similar areas at Coriel Ridge, um, but that would be kind of a second place where we would be looking at anything we can do mechanically. And then, um, you know, even some weed whacking. We've done about 10 acres at Coriel Ridge historically, but it's a hundred acre park. So um, yes, that's absolutely one of our goals. And, you know, if you go to some other parks like Wild Iris Ridge, that used to look a lot like what Bob looks like right now. Suzanne Early Park used to look a lot like what Bob looks like now. And so um, if you're familiar with those places, you know, you can get a sense of the amount we're able to remove Blackberry and Scotch Broom and the level we're kind of able to keep it at with uh, the funding that we have. But we cannot go on private property. I think that was part of the question. Okay. Yeah. And would that also include that... Bloomberg Park? Probably eventually. Um, right now, Bloomberg Park is um, used for the city's leaf program, uses it to store leaves there. And it, it we really need to. I think we would, yeah, we would eventually be working on removing Blackberry there, um, I would expect, but um, that's gonna take more, more thought and coordination with other parts of the city to figure out how to manage the LEAF program. I saw Ellen, had, did you have your hand up? First? Yeah, I didn't know how to put that fancy hand up that other oh, that people works. had. <laughs> so, so I just wanna say I'm, I'm you know, I certainly understand the desire for mountain bike trails, and I don't have any problem with that. I hike a lot around um, Bloomberg and Bob and Coriel Ridge and Arley, and I do a lot of birding and exploring, and I like the quietness of it too. But what I, I have noticed that I wanted to ask the mountain bike community is what can be done about bikers who go on ground that's really too soft to be written on seasonally. And I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the, of the butte um, or the peak up at um, Arley, the, where it's gonna be a hiker only trail, I think. Split Rock, I think is what Rock. you're talking about. At Arley, there's a little- Yeah, yeah. So while well, there's, there's, there's Split a, Rock at Arley is one peak, and then the other peak would actually be Mount Baldy, right? That's like right next to it. But I think you're talking about Split Rock. Oh, I thought I saw it on the plan as something else. But right now, there are bikers that have just churned that into, it's really soft. It's a really big runoff marshy area. And they're just, there are deep ruts in it, and it gets impassable to, to even hike on. Um, and there are other areas I have seen um, in all those areas where, where bikers who, who, who really um, 
I don't know if they just don't know that it's really not a good thing to do and just go do that for fun. But what can be done to what I think needs to be done is to educate people not to ride when when the ground's too soft and to wreck the trails. Yeah. So, I mean, I can at least speak to this from, from two standpoints. Um, so I've worked a little bit with the people at Willamette Lane and I've gotten data on the like counters that count how many hikers there are versus how many bikers, because you can act, they have counters on the different trails there. And um, at Willamette Lane at Thurston, they do seasonal closures of the mountain bike trails. Uh, because they're too, they get too wet over at Thurston and it would damage the trail to ride it. And um, there's times where the trails probably could be opened up because you have a January event where it doesn't rain in like Eugene or Springfield for like a month. Yet, even in those times, if the trails are closed, the usage is almost zero. So I, I think if you were to look at the average biker in the community, you would find that like 95% of them are going to follow the rules, maybe even more. And the biggest thing to display some people from riding, you know, those trails, which right now I, they aren't seasonally closed because they don't actually exist on paper is to develop actual trails. And if those actual trails are there and they need to be closed, then I think those bikers would respect it. Um, I actually, I would be hopeful that at least some of the trails that um, Arley could be ridden more year round, given that the property is more Southern facing and does get some good exposure. For myself, I know I don't ride any of the trails in Oak Ridge that would get damaged by winter riding. I focus on riding at Carpenter Bypass because it's a trail system that is designed for winter riding. And that's, that's where I think you would, if you were to look at biking intensity, most of it is uh, is around those trails that are most sustainable. So I, I, I a hundred percent hear you though, Ellen. And I think the best thing to do is to could to crowd out the riffraff with real, with real sustainable trails and the, they'll start riding those. And once there actually is hiking trails and those biking trails, then people won't be able to just go out and dig a trail or ride a trail that, you know, isn't on the map yet. Yeah. Ellen, um, if yeah. I could jump into as a, board member for DOD, um, when trails become legitimate, then there's a lot more accountability in the mountain bike community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're riding trails that are not legal, they're on private land, or they're um, not properly built trails with the authorization of the land owner or manager, then, you, you know, the trail is renegade and so are the mountain bikers. I'll just put it that way. I mean, and, and so there really is an ownership of the condition of the trails at that point. And that's what we have at Arley. There's, you know, people are just kind of poaching them right now. But where we have legitimate trails, like in Oak Ridge, we have trails, you know, Thurston Hills, um, all see within the community, we tend to crack down internally on people who go and ride those trails when they're too soft or too wet, or especially if they're riding them and they're actually officially shut down. I mean, I literally saw this yesterday in our own social media where a person was talking about riding a trail at Thurston Hills and they got shot down really fast. This is not appropriate. You don't belong out there. It's too soft, you know, uh -huh. you're poaching. So I, I think this will resolve once the trail systems get legitimate and and if city of eugene deems those trails to be too wet at portions of the year and shut them down the dod is absolutely going to support that and we're going to repeat that message on our social media i i also wonder if a simple thing like some signage would also help to just educate people and say you know do please do not ride on these when they're soft you know and they have those so in addition to the the social media advertising about Willamette Lane there's a big year-round like weathered sign that they put in front of the trails and they put a little cable across even though somebody could jump around it that says it is closed for the season and there there's no mistaking that when the trail is closed versus when it's open and you know from the data that I have based upon when they pull the cable back versus the when they open it usage increases by like 98% when it's open. And so when it's shutting down, almost nobody is going to be using the trail, even if it's actually 
probably okay to ride because it, you're talking like a one day difference. And so I, I think, you know, if it's working in June to keep people off the trails in Thurston, it would, it's going to work even, it works even better in January, like basically nobody's on them. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Ellen, though. And, and I, I don't want trails that would be damaging, you know, those sensitive, sensitive soils and sensitive species either. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I see Jory. Thank you. I see Jory has her hand up. Yeah, I'm. At, um, there are a few obsidians um, on this uh, Zoom call tonight. Thank you for all the the planning you've done. We did a hike out there Monday. It's going to hmm. really fun to be out there. Um, is it? I have a, a question. A couple of questions. Um, so when you go out there and hike, it's okay to walk on the private property um, outside the Bob. Yeah. Well, it's private property, so I mean, unless you have permission from the private property owner. So there are a lot of trails that are on the proper private property, though, right north of. Right there, there's a little area at the very north where before we owned Black Oak Basin, there yeah. was a trail that goes off onto private property, and so you might see that when you get to the top. We've um, mowed through some blackberries there. So that you can stay on park property and okay. stay within the park and then make it all the way kind of over to that furthest east big road if that's what you're thinking of okay i think so all right um i have to go back and look at that um so our club has a stewardship committee and we're doing stewardship and partnering with mckenzie river trust and of course we've worked with the city and in the, on the ridge line um Will there be effort for us to partner with you as we do stewardship on the next five to 10 years? Definitely. We'd welcome that. Volunteer opportunity. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. I'm sure there's some other, are there any other? There's just some really good comments in the chat, and I just wanted to let everyone know that we are saving the chat, so we'll definitely share it with the staff here and some of the other people on our team. Um, but I think we've gotten to the questions that are there, unless I miss something, which speak up. And if there's something in there, can, we can maybe change it to a, a question and put it on the Engage Eugene site in some way or have a Q&A thing on there or something. If there's something that we missed or if something comes up, definitely provide comment there on Engage Eugene. Um, and we have a survey on, um, on that site as well. We would appreciate your, it's only, what is it, four questions? It's really short. It's a pretty short survey, so not a long time commitment. All right, well, not hearing or seeing any other hands up. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your evening to listen to us and share your comments and ask questions and uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I'll second that. Thank you very much, everybody. It's great to hear from you. Hope to see you out there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. So too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.